So can you give us an example of how uh, one would analyze a particular asteroid? Well, this is a good example because this is one that has actually been used to look for ice. Now, we've talked a lot about metals recently, but we also talked about that maybe some of these other uh, asteroids that have more volatiles actually could be rich in water or organics or ice. And out in the space, it might actually be more valuable than the metals. Because as we've talked about, you know, that's fuel, that's, that's things. And again, for all of the previous mentioned reasons, very easy to get. So this is 24 Themis. Uh, and uh, Another one that hasn't been visited, so that's our best image. <laughs> right. this, this literally is the groundbreaking image from the very large telescope uh, in Chile, and that's what we get. Uh, but it has been observed in the infrared, and in fact, this is from the NASA Infrared Telescope Facility in Hawaii, uh, where they looked into the uh, all the way up to 3.6 microns. Now, this gap is because our Earth's atmosphere blocks it. Yes. So. It's got a bit of a dip down here, so and about just uh, 3.1 microns or thereabouts. That's right, and it's actually this dip that they got really excited by, because this dip corresponds to a water band. So what they could see is that there appears to be um, some sort of layer of water that maybe isn't uh, as reflective as some of the other composition, showing that either ice or water, they don't know the state of it, but... But it's not going to be liquid water. Exactly. And then it'll boil off. So it's pretty safe to assume then it's ice. Yes. And that ice of H2O, we're not talking about carbon dioxide ice or anything like that. Because that would cause bands in different places. Exactly. So this becomes exciting because, hey, maybe we actually do have an asteroid with lots of ice on it. And these different sets are different measurements at different times. So presumably they measured a different part of the asteroid as it spun around and it's kind of consistently all the way through. It didn't just disappear on one side. Uh, they actually did it again on a second asteroid. So now we pronounce it Sibylle, is it, or something like that? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> but again, this isn't even the best image. This is a model smooth of the best image. So we're really digging down into the uh, dirt here. But we don't actually care about the structure. This is the good thing about looking at some of these bands, is we're just looking at how much light is reflected relative to their signature. And lo and behold, dip again. About the same place. Okay. About the same place. So maybe there's a couple of these asteroids that are rich in water ice. And these would be the bigger ones, but they're presumably for every big one like this, there are a whole bunch of small ones that are just too faint free from a very large telescope or big infrared telescopes to measure these things. Exactly. So at least if you know there's a few of them that exist out there, maybe there's multiple and, well, maybe they're in pockets. In fact, we do know that there's a family that kind of follow Themis, so maybe all of them could be rich in ice if you found kind of the big parent. Okay, so uh, water. Um, how much water is there going to be here? Is there enough to be useful or is it just trace amounts? So this is the question. Well, as you mentioned before, we're only looking at what light is being bounced off the asteroid reflected back to us. We're not getting into the asteroid. So really, we're only measuring the crust. We're only measuring the outside. But still, what if we only said it was a 10 centimeter layer of ice? You know, we're, mm -hmm. I'm not setting the bar that high here. Yep. Uh, I would say if you had 10 centimeters of ice and you saw it all the way around, that's probably safe. Now, the thing is 200 kilometers in diameter. That's relatively big, and it's a big, hefty object. A lot less than the moon, though, so very small. So let's take our 10 centimeter layer. Now, let's figure out how much, how much ice there could be. So we've got to calculate the surface area, um, which is how much area it is all around. And we're, the thickness. And we're assuming it's an even thickness all around. And from the previous data, it appears to be mostly even. So we take 4 times pi times our uh, diameter divided by converting into meters. So because this is in kilometers, we need to convert into meters. So times 1,000 divided by 2. So it's radius. To turn into a radius. Squared gives us a very big. 10 to the 11 square meters. So that's a, it's a big, big apartment. Big apartment, that's right. Now, if we change that into volumes, we multiply it by 0.1 meters. So we're only taking a 10 centimeters thickness. We get 1.3 followed by 10 zeros worth cubic volume. So what does that mean of massive water, though? So we can multiply our volume times density. Yeah, which is ballpark a thousand. For which is pretty straightforward for us. Yeah, yeah, about roughly. We're, you know, we're just trying to get enough rest estimate. And it's actually going to give us about 13 trillion tons of water ice. Yeah, I'm not bad. That's not bad from one very small thing. A lot, lot of rocket fuel out of that. That is a lot of rocket fuel. And you don't need a lot of it to carry it off. And that's the great thing about this. When we've talked about these small objects, again, 
we saw how easy it was to get off the moon. This is 0.0015% the mass of the moon. Um, it's a little bit denser, but it's not going to be harder to leave this from the moon. It's going to be much easier. You have a lot of ice, so maybe you actually have a very viable fuel source in space sitting there. Maybe this is our petrol station.